chapter 18 with me, Matthew chapter 18, if you would, and uh, good music, thank you for that, and, and you know, a lot of you, you could sing if you just practice and show up and, you know, slip into a group, and, and music's a good thing, everybody ought to sing, you ought to enjoy singing, Matthew 18, now we're going to use our Bibles a little bit here at the beginning of the message tonight, and uh, you will think, some of you, that this is all natural and obvious, and uh, if you're not careful, you'll shut me off before I get to the sermon. So follow me tonight. I am going somewhere, but we need to get a little bit of a foundation laid. So Matthew chapter 18, and uh, we're going to read a few verses. Why don't we stand for a moment as we read the scripture, Matthew 18. I realize some people were in shock this morning and I stopped early. In the second, first service, I ran over second service, I was, I, I was early, but whenever I'm preaching and I'm nearing the end of my sermon and the clock is not where it's normally at, I remember this famous quote. Years ago, I was out of town and someone else was in our pulpit and I called Mrs. Goddard and I said, so how was church Sunday in the more this morning? And she said, he preached a great 20 minute sermon and then he preached for 20 minutes more. <laughs> And that lodged in there. When you're done with your sermon, it's always good to stop <laughs> and forget the stupid clock. No one ever complains that I stop preaching early. But anyway, so uh, like the hotel, like the airplane, airline guy said, uh, since we were early, remember that next time. Matthew 18, you follow along as you read a couple verses. At the same time came the disciples to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called the little one, a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Look down at verse 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that there in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 14, even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Father, help us and teach us today and give us some principles, give us some doctrine, but I pray you give us some spark and some desire to make a difference. Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bible open. I'm going to hurry through some of this, and then we're going to be in Matthew 19 and Matthew, and maybe Mark 10, and a couple other places. Um, just let me talk about salvation tonight for a minute or two. Salvation is an act of faith. Um, one of our ladies had a co-worker here this morning with a Catholic background, and, I, and we chatted for a little bit, and I, I wanted to make sure she understood salvation had nothing to do with this church. Salvation had nothing to do with her being good or me being good. Salvation is something between me and the Lord Jesus Christ. He bought it, he paid for it, he offered it to me, and uh, we gotta get it away from the baptistry and the good works, and the, I quit that, and I started, get, gotta get rid of all that stuff. Salvation is an act of faith, trusting the Lord to do what he said he would do. Now, God said he'd save you. God made that very simple. He, he, he said uh, he, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You call on him, he'll be faithful to forgive you. Um, the problem is our doubt. And it's very, it's, it's, it seems complicated and men complicate it. And we get, we get we complicate it because I've been hurt. And I have expectations of this person who hurt me or sinned against me. And, and I hurt this person. And, and because of what hoops I had to jump through to try and reconcile that relationship, I find myself creating a very complex world of forgiveness. Forgiveness was all settled on the cross. The gift of God is eternal life. A free gift. No strings attached. Um, just like Christmas, uh, you get gifts from people that love you. That's what we got at Calvary. That's what we got in the manger story in Bethlehem. Someone who loved me and loved you gave us a gift. Now, look at verse 3, if you would, of Matthew 18. Uh, he said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's look over to Matthew 19 and verse 13. 
Maybe, I don't know if, I don't think we'll have time to go back through chapter 18. We might, but let's look at Matthew 19. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 19 and down at verse 13. They were brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. They had the idea, kids are in the way, we need an adult ministry. To be honest, we ought to have all the children here in church and let the adults sit on the outside and uh, around the perimeter and maybe learn from these little kids in their faith. And, um, but anyway, I don't know why we do. We do, we do because it's traditional Baptist Sunday school and all that, and I'm, I'm for it. I'm smart enough to listen to those that have been down the road before me, unlike a lot of preachers in America. Um, so in verse 14, but Jesus said, suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. That's very important. Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of heaven's like. These kids you want to push out of the way. Um, look over to Mark chapter 10, Matthew and then Mark, next book of your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Mark chapter 10. And this is very near repetition. Uh, these principles, these stories are repeated, and when God repeats it, so we catch it because we're a little dense. Mark chapter 10, and look down at verse 14. Mark chapter 10 and verse 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Now, how little a child is he talking about? Look at the next verse. Verse 16, and he took them, plural, up in his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. So these young children in verse 13, they brought um, young children to, to him that he should touch them and his disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. And he scooped them up. I don't know how many of them is, but it's more than one, probably more than two. And Jesus said, these little children that I'm holding in my arms, unless you can figure out how you can become like them, you'll never get to heaven. It's amazing what the devil's done in our churches. Some little child wants to, to accept Jesus as Savior. Um, or some Sunday school teacher tells about some kids in a small four or five-year-old class that get saved. And uh, some arrogant adult uh, scorns, I just wonder if those kids can understand. Jesus is looking at you wondering if you understand. He's looking at me wondering if I understand. He looks at the little child in the four and five year old department and says, they've got it figured out. Those in the adult Sunday school, I'm worried about them. All right, that's just what we're looking at here. Look over to the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 18. And again, this is all through the, through the gospels. Jesus taught this over and over and over to his disciples and he wanted so much for these disciples to catch this principle about salvation. <clears throat> Luke chapter 18 and look down at verse 16. Let's, let's go back to verse 15. I'm sorry, Luke 18, verse 15. And they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer the little children. Now they're called infants, they're called little children. We're talking about kids. They're not, these are not big kids. These are not these guys in the front row. These are little kids. And he brought these little ones and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. And then verse 18, a certain ruler came along and said, What do I need to do to get to heaven? And, and I'm, I could just see Jesus thinking, You're such an idiot. No, I'm sure Jesus doesn't, doesn't think, that, think that about anybody. I would think that about him. Now, tonight... And I'll look at some more scripture in a minute. In fact, if you want to go back to Matthew 18, 3, and just hang on to that for a minute. You read all these verses, and there's others like them. You cannot help but understand that children are not weak in faith. It's adults who are. I've heard this from missionaries and from old preachers, and they've said often, I would rather have a church's children church praying for me on the mission field than their adult Sunday school because those kids just believe. They just have that childlike faith. Childlike faith is simply believing because God said it. That's enough. Childlike faith is simple. 
Childlike faith is innocent. Childlike faith doesn't try to intellectualize. Childlike faith doesn't try to analyze. Childlike faith doesn't try to put logic into the thing. It just accepts it. Now, whatever salvation faith is, that faith that brings salvation, whatever that is, it's not hard. It's not complex. It's a simple thing. Not only that, whatever the faith is that brings salvation, it brings you to a series of other conclusions. If you look at verse eight, uh, verse 3 of Matthew 18, uh, look down there. It says, Matthew 18, verse 3, he said, except you be converted and become as little children. Um, to be converted, it takes a time and a place. It takes an, it's an event. It's not... Uh, that's the term new birth. It's, it happened. You were born. I was born. What my mom could tell you, whatever time I was born. I remember Josh. I don't remember the other ones. I remember Josh because our first one and, and, uh, middle of the night, all day long labor in the hospital and all that went on with that. And, and, uh, you know, and it's early morning hours and I'm driving Thanksgiving service. We had that, that morning and, and I came home and I put a turkey in the oven because it was thawed out sitting on the counter since we left and uh, put it in the oven. I don't think I took anything out of the inside of it. I don't think I basted it. I don't think I covered it. I just knew it had to get cooked. And then I went to bed for an hour or two and then ran the Thanksgiving morning service, took the turkey out of the oven, probably never ate a bite of it, and then went back to the hospital. It's, birth is a moment. It's a time. It's a place. It's not a possibility. Uh, we're not working at it. It's, it happens at a location. It demands those things. Look over to John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And again, bear with me. I know some of this is very obvious to you, but I'm going somewhere that I want, uh, want us to get this. John chapter 5. You hold John chapter 5. But as we, uh, how many of you, uh, you were with me at one time or another? You, you were on one of our Philippines trips. Raise your hands up. All those in the room, lots of folks. Um, how many times have we stood in front of, a, of an audience of 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 young people and they'll just stand or they'll sit and listen and you go through the gospel and um, does that make sense? And they just stare at you because they're not going to say anything. And um, if you understand Jesus loves you, he died for you. If you understand you're a sinner, if you realize that Christ rose from the dead three days later, he paid your sin, that he's willing to give you eternal life. If that all makes sense, would you be willing to trust him? And, and then you ask him to pray with you and raise a hand. If you just pray that prayer in the sea of hands, hundreds, thousands at a time, trusting Christ of this gracious, warm, innocent young people. I'm not talking about little kids. We were never in an elementary school. They looked like they were. But the youngest we were was high schools. But we were at colleges. Um, I've, I've sat with college students. I've been in college classrooms where I sat in front of a, a room full of college students and they're sitting on top of their desks and they're sitting on each other. The, I'm not being critical. The Filipinos here know that. I, this is true. But the Filipinos don't have this thing called personal space. They, I mean, a room this big, you could seat a thousand Filipinos easy. Um, I mean, no problem whatsoever. Maybe two thousand on a good day. Um, they, and they'll, they'll, you know, I've had them in a classroom, college, and and uh, and just glued to my every word and would you be willing to trust Christ you understand and they'll ask questions yes I want to get saved they'll all get saved the open candidness and and uh, I think brother Ken you were at a mall with some college students right and they all got saved at the mall out in public no no inhibitions whatsoever we've been out in public places at ball fields and and uh, we, you know, playing basketball with these kids out there. I, I remember, I think it was Nate Beal was with us and uh, playing basketball. Got everybody together and they're all, you know, and he's looking down at everybody here. And I mean, the most open, warm-hearted, surrendered, I, I need Jesus. I understand it. And I uh, can't even begin to tell you how many people in America would look at that, especially preachers, and say, oh, yeah, I bet they, I bet they got saved challenging whether they did they really understand how do you really understand do you know what the more i study salvation the more i wonder if i really understand how could my sins 
be paid for 2,000 years ago? How could, how could he forgive me when I sin intentionally? How could he forgive me over and over and over for the same sin? But you know what? No third grader ever asked those questions. Third grader just says, you saved me? That's nice. <laughs> you want to tell me how to get to, you'll tell me how to get to heaven? You mean God loves me? I like that. You know, we're, we're so intellectual, we're stupid. We're just backwards. John chapter 5, look there at John chapter 5, verse 24. And again, I'm, I'm headed somewhere. I just want to get you some scripture. Look at verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that, what's the first thing you have to do? Hear. He that heareth my word. What's the next thing? And what? Believeth. Believeth on him that sent me. What's the next word? Hath. Everlasting life. Well, that's not real hard, is it? Did you hear? Did you receive those truths? And did you put your faith in that truth? Well, I, I don't know. I, I've never heard a kid say, I don't know if I really believe. You know what happens? Across, how many of you here, and I'm not picking on you, but how many of you here as a child, you made a profession of faith and you got into your teen years and you ran through it, or your adult years, you, you ran through it once more because you really wanted to make sure it was clear. Sure, there's nothing unusual, uncommon about this. It's a very common thing. You know why? You got messed up. You went to school too much. You read too many wrong books, watched too much TV. You got in relationships where you were offended and you offended others and parents and teachers and people began putting all this complex thinking into your head. And, and I'm not saying whether you were or were not saved as a child. By the way, if anybody came to me saying, I'm not sure I got saved, I'd kind of like to do it again. I never. That's, that's personal between them and God. Uh, this morning, uh, one of our little guys uh, was questioning about whether he could get baptized or not. And I said, look, this is between you and God whenever you're ready. I don't care. Now, five years from now, ten years from now, um, faith is theirs. Salvation is theirs. And, and baptism scares little guys. You know, that big preacher's going to push me down underwater. And I'll hold you till you blubber. Um, no, but, but um, salvation is such a simple thing. He says there, look at that verse again. He that verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath present tense everlasting life. But look at this. He's not done and shall not come unto condemnation. That means back here, you put your faith, you heard and you believed, you trusted. And at that very moment, you have everlasting life. Not only do you have everlasting life, you shall not ever, ever, ever come unto judgment. Your sins cannot be judged. Your sins cannot come before God. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've got some questions. I don't understand all the Bible. I'm not going to say I do. I've read it and read it and read it. I've got some questions, but not on this matter of salvation. I don't have any questions on that. He has everlasting life. And you see, why are my sins not going to come unto judgment? Because they already were. My sins already were judged. My sins, clear back here 2,000 years ago, God beat Jesus Christ to, to, because of me. And every sin I ever sinned, he was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we are healed. The chastisement of our peace was laid on him. Isaiah teaches us all about that. So he that heareth and believeth hath present tense everlasting life and shall not ever, ever come into condemnation. Look at the rest of that verse. He's not done yet. But is present tense passed from death unto life. You read in Ephesians, it tells us that we are already seated in heavenly places. See, we've got an eternal God who is as aware of the cross and the Garden of Eden as he is Wildemar today and this day of the second coming and the day of the, the uh, new heaven and the new earth being made. God is timeless. God is in all these times. And so I am already, my sins were already judged. 
I have already been made righteous, 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, and I already am seated in heavenly places. You say, could you lose your salvation? It's not mine to lose. Could you go to hell? I'm already in heaven. I can't go to hell. I'm there already. What if you fall away? You can't fall away. You're there. What if you slip? I'm already there. I am seated in the heavenlies at this very moment in the hand and eye of an eternal God who lives without time. Now you and I know I'm here and, and you say, I'm not sure I understand it. That's because you're too old. Our little guys and girls don't have a problem understanding this. He is already passed from death to life. You were, Ephesians tells us, dead in trespasses and sin. Romans talks about it. Dead in trespasses and sin. When you get saved, you have everlasting life. John 3, 16, whosoever believeth in him should, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We are already, I moved from a place of death to a place of life. I moved from a place, John 3 says, I'm already condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. Do you know the lost man is already in hell in the eyes of God? He's already condemned. The saved man is already in heaven. And that's why when you accept Christ, you are moved from death unto life. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, I mean, it's, and it's so simple. How, how hard is it? Well, he that heareth and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Look over to John 10, just a couple of pages. John chapter 10, verse 28. I don't believe you can make salvation any more simple to the sinner. And I don't believe you can make it too detailed and complex for the Savior. What Jesus did is beyond comprehension. The complexity of, the, of redemption, of justification, of reconciliation, of sanctification, of uh, all that he did on the cross and all that he will do in, in our Christian life, it is off the charts intellectual. But what you got to do to get saved, little four-year-old could get it. John, John 10, look at verse 28. John 10, verse 28, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. It's simple. You put your faith in Christ, he gives you eternal life. And when he gives you eternal life, he gets a hold of you. And you aren't going to get away. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I'm a new creature. When I got saved, I was placed in Christ. And I, you say, what does that mean? I don't know, but isn't it great? <laughs> a new creature. I'm, I'm brand new. The Bible says I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit. He comes to live inside me. And that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. Which means the moment I trust Christ, the Spirit of God moves inside as the down payment, the promissory note, where God says, I am giving you my very divine spirit so that you will know that I will fulfill my promise and my commitment to give you a heavenly home with golden streets and gates of pearl and walls of pure gold. That's your heavenly inheritance. But I want you to know something just to make sure you know how serious I am. I'm going to give you my very presence. And if I don't let you go to heaven, if I let you go to hell, I'm going with you. Amen. I'm saved. Now, how do, you, how do you get saved? You don't, it's not real hard to figure out. It's simple. Now, notice this. And this is where I'm, I'm going somewhere. A person hears. A person believes what they heard. They're willing to, they're willing to accept it. At that very moment, they are what? And it's not a trick question. Saved. All right. So they hear, they believe, and they are what? Saved. Saved, and I give unto them what kind of life? Eternal life. So the moment 
This person gets saved. They have what kind of life? And they shall never and they have passed from death unto okay well we're good with all that right now let's just run through the scenario um, because this is where we really struggle with this and and way too much what they do next does not change what they did what you did here is forever what you do here cannot affect what you did there now if if uh come on up here michael use michael robotic because he's sleeping anyway michael gets saved right here now his name is written in the book of life and he is passed from death unto life and his name's in that book of life he's forgiven He's already seated in heavenly places. Uh, and I give unto them eternal life. So he's got eternal life. Let's say he got saved today. Now let me ask something. If he got saved at 731 on Sunday night, in two minutes is he saved? What does he have to do to stay saved? How about in the morning when he gets up, is he saved? What does he have to do? It all got done, right? Now, when I lead someone to Christ, unless there's something unusual, I run through this in a different formula, but I still run through this. A week from now, now what, if, what if he doesn't come back to church Wednesday night? Is he still saved? All right, let's go up the path of life a little bit. This is a couple years have passed now. He's been in church, Sunday school, reading his Bible, but then a curse enters into his life. A girl <laughs> and they end up getting married and she doesn't go to church and uh, obviously between him and her she wins and you say why because that's the case in every marriage and um she wins they're out of church and um what happened back here to him he got what and he passed from unto life and his name was written in the book of life and so he is saved and his sins were now we're four or five six years down the road um he's back in church now his wife got saved and they're doing great and um is he still saved still saved you know why because it all it all happened christ paid it for his sins back there now that makes sense now we could take this thing go on down there because my microphone cord is going to get tangled up he's now 70 80 years old losing it mentally like some of us are uh, he's in some uh, convalescent home and you go visit him and he can't remember whether he got saved or not does he, does he have to remember being saved to be saved who saved him? God saved him. Who paid for his sins back there 2,000 years ago? Jesus did. His sins were paid for back there. He was, he, he was, uh, uh, he accepted the payment for his sin here. He was born again. He was uh, justified, just as if he'd never sinned. And he's down the road here. He's not sure he's saved. But you know what? He didn't have to know he's saved he knows he's saved and he's the only one that matters all right so here's a guy been in church read his bible knew what it said but now later in life he's got some doubts and he's not quite sure caleb stay right there caleb come on up now caleb is uh he's some kid rode my bus when he was four or five years old and he accepted Christ as Savior. He understood he's a sinner and he needs to be saved. And he trusts Christ as Savior because he knows Jesus loves him. Because it's simple when you're five years old to understand that. And his parents moved right away. And she so go on up here a little bit. And now he's 10 years old. He's not been in church because his parents moved. There's no Sunday school bus in the town he lives in. And uh, the Baptist churches are dead, backslidden worship services where they sing praise and wave their hands and have rock concerts but fail to tell people how to get to heaven 
And this poor guy, he's 10 years old. And one of his friends comes up to him and says, hey, are you saved? And he says, I don't know. Is he still saved? He's as saved as that guy is. See, you don't have to know you're saved to be saved. You have to have been saved to be saved. So this guy, he's been, he got saved, came to Sunday school a little bit, but he's been off. He has no clue. He, he, he never got reading his Bible. He never got baptized. He never got busy in a Sunday school class or anything. And now he's up here 20, 25 years or old or so, and he doesn't understand it all. He certainly doesn't have a grasp of the doctrine of substitutionary atonement or, or any of what, what Christ did on the cross. But he is as saved as he is saved because he's the one who does the saving. All right, now go away, guys. Now we're going somewhere else. So we're all okay with that, aren't we? Uh, now, I'm sitting in front of a, a, a story of 12-year-old, 13-year-old girls being forced into prostitution in Cambodia. And you wonder what life they've got. I'm looking at a, you know, the flood victims of the Philippines, thousands of people in um, lives last couple of years ago and they had those mudslides and just whole, whole little villages just gone under the mud, just gone. Hundreds of people gone, never found again. Uh, you um, see the young people raised up in uh, the Middle East and, and um, abused and taken advantage of and um, tortured or what else wrong goes on. A child dies in some village in a land where there's no medical attention. Or... The scenario I often think of, I look at our soldiers across the world, and uh, I love looking at anything I can find. Especially documentaries, they tend to be a little less vulgar, but um, I watch some of the military things, and I see somebody in another country, some operation goes wrong, and some guy dies. You know what we can do? We can get kids saved. I may not be able to get all of the military to trust Christ, but if we can keep those buses running, we can win those boys and girls to Jesus back here. And you want to go to Cambodia or Vietnam or Laos where they're taking little girls and shoving them off into the world of pornography and lewd, filthy living. We may not be able to change that country, but you know what? If we had enough missionaries over there, Right now, if you read, read the back of your bulletin, the backyard of these missionaries like Johnny Esposito, it's a gathering place for children. You know what? Those people maybe steeped in Buddhism or some other religion, but you know what? They don't mind their kids playing in the backyard of the Americans. And as the Americans play and talk to them, they teach them about Christ. One of our missionaries said that a little girl, 14 years old, came up to him. She'd been coming to his Sunday school, and she said, I wanted to say goodbye. He said, why? She said, my dad's selling me tomorrow. It's my birthday. And that was probably 10 years ago. She's probably dead by now, but she's not. She's very, very much alive today. You say, how do you explain all that she had to face? All I know is that Christ came to save sinners. What can we do? What can we do to help the, the soldiers? What can we do to help the, you know, I look at our police. I think most people join the law enforcement of America with noble causes, justice and truth, and they want to be the good guy, and then they get into a system that perhaps is not as good as they thought it was, and corruption creeps in, and garbage creeps in, and crime, and, and wrong, and, and somebody loses their life. You know, the only hope of that cop who got eaten up in a, in a system of corruption is that bus worker who gets that eight-year-old boy to come on his Sunday school bus or the youth department 
who has a big youth activity and they have a bunch of teens down to the church for pizza and playing ball and that 13 or 14 year old boy comes to church and gets saved or the Sunday school teacher who goes up to a home his kid lives in this house and he says to his friend hey any other teenagers on your street let's go visit them the, the, the Sunday school teacher who steps out beyond his comfort zone and gets the, the kid, the, the boys that maybe ride his bus or the kids that go to his Sunday school classes, come on, let me take me up, let me introduce me to your neighbor and introduce me to the kid up the street and help me meet who, who, you, who do you go to school with, who rides the bus. Those kids in this community, they know where the kids are in their neighborhood. And you step out of your comfort zone enough to let that kid go up. You go knock on that door and say, hey, Johnny and Billy or, or Juan and Martine or whoever, and they ride our bus. And we want to, do you talk to the mom or the daddy? Can we talk to your little boy? Uh, we want to talk to Pedro or Maria or Billy and Johnny about coming on the bus. And, and no, they can't come. They go to the Catholic Church. Well, hey, would you mind if they come out? We're just talking about God out here with their friends. Can we talk to them? Oh, yeah, go ahead. And how many times the faithful Sunday school teacher led some kids to Christ, often in the very presence of the parents. Now, we don't know where those kids are going, but we know one thing they're doing. They're going to heaven. Because a faithful Sunday school teacher, a faithful soul winner, went to them and got them saved. Luke chapter 9, verse 48 says this, Whosoever receiveth this child in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you, the same shall be great. You know what God looks at? You that are willing to receive that child. You that are willing to go to that young person and say, I'm willing to put my life in a situation where I can, get, where I can reach that kid. Just like the angels, the night Jesus was born, they said unto us, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. And he talked about what shall be joy to all people. You know, our job is, our job is to go into that world. And I may not be able to reach the 50-year-old, the 40-year-old, the 30-year-old, or the 20-year-old, but that 10-year-old, I can reach them. And if you've been with us in any of these mission trips, oh, the hearts of kids are so open. Uh, I was preaching at a conference in New Zealand, and the man, the, the socialist world just sucks the spiritual life out of adults. But we had lots of kids come, and I preached to great crowds of teenagers. And you know, those teenagers are so open to the gospel. They're, so, they're just so graciously open to the fact that Jesus would save them. We live in a world where young people ought to say, I want my life to make a difference. And where adults ought to say, I want my life to make a difference with children. Could I just say a, a couple of quick things? The bus ministry is huge. We shouldn't be looking for bus drivers. We should have them lined up. I understand some of you aren't going to preach. I understand some of you, you're not comfortable. Uh, you're a little, little shy maybe. You're not going to go knock on the door of a stranger. I, I, all right, I accept that. Can you drive a bus? So the one who isn't reserved has somebody in control of the bus so they can get the job done. Most of us are very comfortable working with young people. We need, um, I, ought to, I ought to right now have a list, and I haven't asked, but I ought to right now have a list of people waiting for me to get that next bus on the road. If I say in three weeks, or January 1st, we'll be able to put one more bus on the road, I need a bus captain, four or five bus workers, and a bus driver, or two bus drivers, it ought to be instant, just like that. This is a term, this is forever. This is forever and ever and ever understand this that child who's five years old who rides that bus and gets saved he's saved forever yes. connie mcdowell's got a couple on her route they're here this morning sat right over here in this section i've been to their home they're so confused by religions and doctrine i i was there for an hour i have no idea if they're saved they have no idea if they're saved connie thinks they might be saved but you know what you're not going to find the five-year-old you wonder about not going to find the eight-year-old you wonder about. You go with us to the Philippines, and you sit in front of a crowd of, uh, I got a picture of, of Maggie Mowry, uh, uh, Rocky, and Gary's girl. She's, after we would preached to everybody, and she, was, she walks out to the, out, there's an outdoor basketball court, and uh, she's standing there holding this basketball. In the first picture, there must be 200 kids around her. We just scattered a distance. And then the next picture, they're closer, and the next picture, all it is is blackheads. 
I mean, they're just tight, no space. And she's there by herself, witnessing to all those kids. And every one of them that got saved, it's locked in. Locked in. They're saved forever. What do they have? To, don't they have? They don't have to do nothing. He did it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And no, there's nothing, nothing we have to do. It's all paid in full. There ought not be a lack of Sunday school teachers. If we get in a situation where we have to have large children's ministry because of the corrupt society, because of insurance, because of lawsuits, we, we might get where we have to completely change our, our Sunday school philosophy and have big classrooms and multiple adults in every classroom. Uh, there, there shouldn't be a second between me saying I need five new workers and me having them there. Shouldn't be a thing at all. I mean, nothing. Understand, this moment in time, salvation is instantaneous. Salvation is a moment, a place, a, 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 a situation that, is, that has to take place. And once that thing takes place, forever their name is settled in heaven. Forever their sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. And God removed our transgressions from us. And the very moment that child gets saved without any any hesitancy without any window of exception their sins are removed from them and they've passed from death unto life this is forever this is huge keeping our sunday school classes well manned is it's it's off the charts important these missions trips that we, we that we go on you may not be able to go but you can finance them and you, you that have been with us, you know how much a few hundred dollars will do in the mission field. Hundred dollars, maybe put another jeepney on the road. That one jeepney, it's like a, an, a, it's like a Hummer with no windows stretched. Bring a hundred kids to church. At least 50. Most of them will get saved. They don't have a problem with it. These mission trips are huge. I'm, I'm trying to work a way to plan two this year. I'm going to take a small group of men to Fiji and Vanuatu and New Caledonia, and I'll take a larger group if, they, if we can get the money together to, to the Philippines. One trip to the Philippines. Uh, I know one trip. I, I don't count. I've just never been good at I don't keep track of anything, but some of our people started counting. They, they were counting our converts in tens of thousands. How many people do you want to see saved? How many do you want to talk to? Because most people you talk to will get saved. These missions trips are vital. We've got to finance them. Supporting our missionaries is vital. Right now, Dave Matuzak and Doug Marco are sitting in a new city with a new international airport. And, and that city right now, it's only 20 minutes from Nathan Goodpastor, a missionary we support. If... 20 of us were to go there right now, we would wear out before we'd reach everybody. I mean, people that are ready to get saved. We're not talking about you're going to have to sit and spend six weeks convincing them. I mean, people that are ready to get saved. And that, that salvation, he that heareth and believeth on him that sent me, hath, present tense, everlasting life, and is passed from death unto life. It's done. It's a transaction. It's like you bought it, it's yours. What you do with it is up to you, but your salvation, it's a settled thing. The idea of supporting missionaries, it goes without saying. We need that mission budget up. We need the money for these mission trips to be up. I, I've, got, I've got six, five or six college boys already that want to go with me to uh, Fiji and Vanuatu. And uh, I ought to, I'd love to be able to say, got your way paid, settled. Right now, I'm saying it's going to probably cost two to $3,000 per young man praying for our young people to live for others ought to consume us. You ought to walk in here and, and look around the room and pray for God to touch the hearts of our young people. We ought to be praying. Um, there ought to be young men in here chomping at the bit to take bus routes from old guys. Not that there's any old guys on bus routes, but in case any of our bus captains get old, 
there ought to be there ought to be people Charles you drive a bus this morning who did I see drive? oh Bill I saw Bill I passed I knew I was trying to think who I passed Bill was driving down Mission to Palomar this morning Bill there ought to be somebody saying hey you getting old Bill I'm, I'm ready to take your spot there ought to be people fighting to have his seat now, he's not going to give it up but there ought to be people in line wanting that seat there ought to be people saying uh, to Connie McDowell, Connie, just I'll work on the bus, but you you need to you ever get feeling like you can't do it? I'm I'm running this thing. We ought to be excited about people getting saved. Now, the tithe off of a bus doesn't pay the gas, let alone a tire. But the fact is, Jesus made it very clear over and over. He said, "Except ye be converted and become as little children." He said. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Over three times he said that. He said in John 5, He that heareth and believeth hath, present tense, everlasting life. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. Uh, who, if you had a choice, just think, if you had a choice of witnessing to someone who'd get saved easily or witnessing to someone who's going to be skeptical and not listen, who would you choose? You know, Brian Wiggins over here, he and I have been on the phone back and forth on speakerphone with some guys on base talking to him, um, trying to help him understand and trying to, you know, whether get saved or understand spiritual issues. I've never had anybody say, my kids are really wrestling with this matter of faith. <laughs> kids just get saved. And they just get saved. Now, we need to disciple them. And if we can keep them in church and all that, that's all wonderful. And you know I'm for that. Here at our church, Jesus said, he that receiveth this little child in my name receiveth me. I wonder at Faith Baptist Church, how are we doing at receiving Jesus? But when you walk around the property, do kids move you or do they get in the way? Some quick conclusions. Number one, we've got to keep telling people. Number two, we've got to keep running our buses. Number three, we've got to keep missionaries with enough money number four we've got to keep mission trips going number five we've got to keep sunday school as a top priority we need to understand that the main goal of this church is to get people saved i mean let me just say it's about our about our finances here a christian who's thinking clearly will be more concerned how many people got saved than the money expenditures Now, you know, we put out financial statements and the money. The books are always open here. And you want to know about money, talk to Brother Ron, talk to me. But Ron knows more than I do. Um, man, it's people getting saved is it. The job of Faith Baptist Church is getting people saved. That's it. Young people, can I say to you, young men, young ladies, you teenagers, you should decide I will spend my life getting people into heaven. Forever. I don't care what your career is. But you ought to decide you're going to be a soul winner. And if you're awkward talking to people, you ought to decide, I'm going to do what I can, but out of this, my wallet's going to be open. I'm going to help soul winners. I'm going to help. I was, I was talking to one of our, a couple of our guys this afternoon. Um, Lane Jones has got a radio station. He desperately needs someone to just say, I'm going to run that radio station. And it reaches thousands and thousands of people. Somebody that can study and think through the engineering part of a radio station. And then somebody who's got enough fundamental ideas that they can search the world and bring in godly preaching and godly music and sit in that little cubicle making sure everybody in the island of Samar hears the gospel. And he needs somebody today. If, if somebody today, you and if you ever landed in, Brian's been with me in Samar, you land in Samar, it's an experience. And uh, one time the plane went too far, went off, and it sat there, and no one else could land because it's only this little tiny runway. And if a pig's on it or people go walking on it, it's the only flat spot on the island. Anyway, it's a mess. It really is a mess. It's, it's the only place I've ever been in the Philippines where I was a little scared. But, um, but at least everybody was low. <laughs> you could land on Samar today and be put to work the rest of your life running a radio station, getting the gospel out to tens of thousands of people. That's why we need to stay faithful going soul winning. 
Thursday night, Brother Sandberg organized people. He's got to keep that crowd together. We need you on Thursday night, Saturday mornings. We need you. Brother Russell meets with our group. And Brother Victor still meets with our bus workers. We need to be out on the streets. We've got to do it. There's a reason for you to have tracks in your pocket and pass out gospel tracks. There's a reason to have our jails uh, supplied with workers. There's a reason to have our rest homes filled with workers. Look, this is not about who gets to be the pastor or who's the, you know, who's the important person. There's nobody important here. Marilee Savage leads people to Christ, that makes her important. Evelyn Morales leads people to Christ, that makes her important. Who cares? None of it matters. Can we get that bus out there safely and get it back safely so a bunch of those kids can hear the gospel from some Sunday school teachers and get those kids saved? Because let me tell you something, we don't know where America's going, and I don't know who's going to lose their life in a helicopter accident over Afghanistan, but if we got those kids saved when they were children, they're locked in. Somebody sent me a, a text. Wow, the world lost a great man in Nelson Mandela. What do you think? And I said, I, never even, I don't know who the world's he. But I'll tell you who's somebody. I mean, and I'm not stupid. I know who he is in historical figure. He was in school with Washington or something. But no, no, I, I'm joking. I, I have no problem with his contribution to society and to the freedom of South Africa. But the guy who led me to Christ, that guy's important. The little grandma who leads her grandchild to Christ and gets a name, a new name written in glory, is more important than the President of the United States. That Sunday school teacher who teaches in one of these classrooms, four and five or six or eight year old kids or 10 or 12 year old children, that Sunday school teacher who leads a soul to Christ is more important than an ambassador to a foreign country or a general of an army because what they do is forever. As a church, Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's got to be our marching orders. We've got to do it. We've got to keep this thing right. And we've got to be very careful to be scoffers. Um, that world out there, especially across the ocean, the third world countries, especially in the Philippines right now, if, if I could get 20 more of our guys over there working in these colleges like Randy DeMoville has and, and, uh, and Rick Martin has, you wouldn't believe it. You just, you would not even believe what could happen if the churches in America realized young people are the key. We've just got to do it. And by the way, the leper colonies are important. The rest homes are important. It's not just kids, but people need to get saved. All right, let's pray. Father, help us tonight. Help us to get our, our theology squared away that this salvation thing is once forever. And that we may not be able to get everybody into church. Think of Brother Matuzak having a thousand high school seniors a week sitting in front of him. They're, they'll never get all those kids to church. There is not a church for all those kids. But he has a chance to get them into heaven. There's a savior for them. There's a heavenly home for them. There's a God that loves them. And I pray you'd help us realize that South Africa is that way. And so is South America. And so is the Middle East and all the soldiers that today are in harm's way around the world. Every one of them was a little boy. And now in some cases, sadly, are a little girl who could have been saved had a Sunday school teacher or a bus worker picked him up for church. Pray and help us remember to pray for our kids. And though we may not be able to change every adult's life, we could change every adult's eternity if we'd get them saved as children. May we be uh, loving, kind, may we take care of our security, our Sunday school teachers, our, all the things that we've got to do to keep our buses safe and our drivers adequately trained. And Lord, I pray our church would not lose sight of this matter of buses, of Sunday school, of Christian education, and then the mission field. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for a minute. We'll have a word of more of invitation. Wow, what a...